Hi. So I'm Steve Friedland, a professor of urology at Cedar sinai Medical Center and Cedar sinai Cancer, as well as the Durham VA Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. And it's my great privilege and honor here today to be with a, a dear friend, a phenomenal investigator, uh, Professor Naraj Argawal, who is a professor of medicine at the and the director of the GU Medical Oncology Group there um, at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, University of Utah. So welcome to the program, uh, Naraj. Thank you for having me. Such an honor. Yeah, that's it's great. Um, so we're going to be talking today ab about your really practice changing Talipro two study. Um, but first, you know, it, it's a really interesting combination of abiraterone or no, no, sorry, enzalutamide to block antigen receptor and uh, talazoprib, a PARP inhibitor. But first, give me a little bit of background. What, what's the rationale for combining these two mechanisms of action? Great question, Steve. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me take a step back and talk about the MCRPC as a disease and uh, path to progression to MCRPC. Uh, and then the need for uh, to block HRR uh, uh, mutation or mutated prostate cancers with the more intensification therapy up front. So I'll take a moment here because most people I, in my experience, have not really delved into this area before talking about the data. In the United States, vast majority of patients are diagnosed to have localized prostate cancer. And metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer or de novo metastasis is only happening in 5 to 10% patients. If you look at those localized prostate cancer, as you have done seminal work in this area, after definitive radiation therapy or surgery, Unfortunately, 20 to 50 percent patients have PSA recurrence, and then they are traditionally treated with ADT, intermittent ADT, continuous ADT, and now based on your trial, Embark trial data, the, many of them will be treated with enzalutamide. But until now, and in yeah. the next coming many years, we will have ma vast majority of MCRPC patients actually progressing to MCRPC through that localized prostate cancer route and not de novo metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer route. And MCRPC is actually much bigger burden of cancer, if you will, than MCSPC, if you will. So the, that's number one. Number two, if you look at the prevalence of homologous recombination and pair mutations, that's present in 25% patients with MCRPC. That's a, a huge number of patient population. And then third point I wanted to uh, make before uh, as, a, as laying the ground for this discussion, that the aggressiveness of MCRPC is much higher in patients who have HRR mutations as evidenced by the, we'll be discussing the control arm of PFS, control arm PFS with enzalutamide alone in the MCRPC first line setting. It was only 11 month PFS uh, with PSA progression compared to 20 month in the PREVAIL trial in all comer population. So we have three things so far. Number one, MCRPC is a large patient population. Number two, 25% patients have homologous recombination repair mutations. Number three, they poorly respond to standard therapies. And number four, half of the patients do not receive subsequent lines of therapies. Your work, Dan George's work, we publish in this area that intensification works in all stages, all cancers, all metastatic disease setting, because we lose half of the patients with subsequent line of therapy. So if you combine all of that together, yes, we have PARP inhibitors available in later lines of therapies, but we felt the need to combine PARP inhibitor with ARPI in first-line MCRPC setting based on the preclinical rationale, based on the encouraging results from the study 850 patient trial of abiraterone plus olaparib versus abiraterone, and all these facts which compelled us to do this trial in this setting. No, it's great. So, so tell us ab about the study. So the Talapru two trial. In fact, there were two trials in one trial. <laughs> so there were all comer population, eight hundred patients who were all prospectively tested for presence or absence of homologous recombination or pair mutations, and they were randomized to enzalutamide plus talazoparib versus enzalutamide alone. And then we we 
prospectively tested another 230 patients, determined them to be HR positive, and we additionally enrolled them on the trial as cohort two, and we included 130, 169 patients from this all-comer cohort to make this HRR positive cohort. So to make it simple, there are 800 patients who are all-comer patient population, and of them, majority of them were HRR negative. 169 patients, about 20%, 25% were HRR positive. So we reported the results on those trials in that trial, all-comer patient population first, and then we reported the results on the HRR mutated patient population in the ASCO 2023. So this was so the what, design of the trial, yeah. And what did you find? So if you look at the primary endpoint, radiographic progression-free survival, if you only look at HRR mutation patients first, there was a 55% reduction in risk of disease progression or death with a hazard ratio of 0 0.5, 0 0.45. This is a very compelling reduction in risk of progression or death, especially in that patient population, which already has been established to do not respond very well to standard therapies. Now, if you look at overall survival, it's trending quite well. The maturity level is quite low, it's like 25, around 25% patient events so far have been met for overall survival. So obviously we do the overall survival data are not mature, but it's still the hazard ratio is 0 0.61. So I have no doubt that we will show overall survival benefit in addition to having shown RPFS benefit in this patient population. But I would also like to bring your attention to some clinically relevant endpoints, which are relevant to our patients. Time to PSA progression. In the control arm, it was 11 months. If you look at experimental arm with talazoparib, it was 28.6 months. So 17 month delay in PSA progression. Very similar was the theme with chemotherapy, time to delay in chemotherapy, time to progression on subsequent therapies. Interestingly, if you look at the quality of life, one of the major secondary endpoints was time to deterioration in quality of life. And we, what we found was quite intriguing that while these patients were being treated with two agents versus one agent, enzalutamide plus talazoparib, there was a significant delay in time to clinical, mm -hmm. clinically meaningful deterioration in quality of life. So that is about HR mutation positive patients, that cohort. And this mm -hmm. these data have led to approval of, FD approval of, uh, enzalutamide plus telazoparib combination in the U.S. for our patients with MCRPC with HR mutations. Yeah, I mean, congratulations. It's, it's a great study. Um, I know our audience is, is probably U.S.-based, but we do have some people outside the U.S. and we're not sure, you know, what, what other countries are necessarily going to say in terms of approval, but there, there's possibilities that it may be broader or different. Um, so can you give us a little idea of, of the cohort one, the all comers, what you saw Absolutely. in that cohort? Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, for the opportunity to talk about cohort, uh, all comer cohort, because uh, that those data are important in my view. First of all, it has the, the approval has not been ruled out yet, even in the US. We are waiting for more maturity on the overall survival data to see how the trends are. So the approval has not been ruled out. We just got the approval from the FTA in the HR mutation cohort. But as you said, uh, Steve, we have we uh, got approval for this combination in the European Union just like two weeks ago. And it was quite discussed uh, for all comer patient population. So let me, yeah, thank you. So let me let me just discuss about the data in the all comer patient population. So again, prospectively tested patients. If you look at all patients, zero hazard ratio was 0 0.63, 37% reduction in risk of progression or death. Again, every single clinically meaningful endpoint or other endpoints were met and were favoring the combination of, so time to deterioration and quality of life, time to PSA progression, time to cytotoxic chemotherapy, time to progression on subsequent therapy, all favored the combination of, of enzalutamide plus talazoparib. The overall survival data are immature right now. The trends are not, uh, they're there, but in the absence of overall survival, I would not delve into that very much. But overall, 
if you look at the patients who are HRR negative, meaning they did not have HRR mutation, even by prospective tumor tissue testing, which is considered the gold standard, there was a significant delay in radiographic progression with a hazard ratio of 0.66. So 34% reduction in risk of progression or death, even in those patients who were HRR mutation negative by prospective tumor tissue testing. Now, it doesn't mean every patient with who have negative who are negative for mutation should be offered this drug. Well, we are waiting for the for more data from the overall survival perspective. But I think next steps are to be to find out who are these patients who are responding. But we can we can delve into that discussion later. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I mean, it's, it's great, and and so I would love to to hear more about who you think is is the best candidate. But before we do that, you know. The the delays in deterioration of quality of life extremely important. Very very great that you guys track that. Uh, but tell me a little bit about the side effects. What what would patients expect to see on this combination? Yes, and uh, so, so there's no discussion about the efficacy data can be complete without the discussion of side effects. So I'm glad you yeah. brought up that question. So PARP inhibitors as a class have three major side effects in general. Hematologic toxicities, gastrointestinal toxicities, and fatigue. Now, each PARP inhibitors are separate, different compounds, different molecules, different targets. So side effects can vary. So for example, in case of thalazoparib, I think the side effects are predominantly hematologic. The, in case of olaparib, you may see little more domination of gastrointestinal side effects, such as nausea and vomiting. In case of niraparib, you have some unique side effects, such as hypertension, cardiovascular side effects. But the bottom line is, all these side effects are very well managed, very manageable. Most side effects happen within three to four months of starting PARP inhibitors. And we can easily recognize, as long as we follow these patients more often early on in first three to four months, we can easily recognize patients who are going to develop severe side effects. And we can preempt those side effects in case of anemia, for example, by timely reduction in dose of thalazoparib, or in case of nausea and vomiting, my practice is to actually write anti-nausea medication prescriptions mm. When I, wrote, when I write the prescription for Olaparib for the first time or PARP inhibitors for the first time, or for Niraparib, I tell my patients to regularly monitor their blood pressure. So if you just look at the Talapro 2 trial, which is the focus of the discussion today, if you look at how many patients had grade one, two anemia at the baseline, 49% patients had grade one or two anemia at baseline in all comer cohort, and 56% patients one or two anemia at baseline in HRR mutation positive cohort. Mm. And what does it tell me is that MCRPC is associated with a symptomatic state of prostate cancer or a Im symptom, impending symptoms, if you will. If you don't have symptoms, they will have symptoms very soon. And anemia is present in a very large number of patients to begin with. Now we treat them with PARP inhibitor, which are known to cause anemia. What we see is worsening of anemia in many patients. Surprisingly, if you look at how many patients actually discontinued thalazoparib in the all-comer cohort, 8.5% patients. And if you look at median dose intensity of thalazoparib, that was more than 80%. So what is the, what is the uh, lesson for me from these data that these patients require, most of these patients require only one level dose reduction and they do fine after that. And as evidenced by most patients not having to discontinue telazoparib because of great uh, because of anemia, and if you look at median dose intensity uh, intensity of telazoparib, that's eighty yeah, percent. I true. feel very confident that these patients, most of these patients, and actually we have all those patients in our clinic, which are on PARP inhibitors for years now, not only months, two years. And I'd like to also add one more point. Median time to onset of anemia was 3.4 months. So as long as we follow these patients in first three, four months, we know, uh, I often actually do monthly lab testing 
uh, local lab testing. I don't even have mm. to have them come into my clinic. And patients who are actually uh, dropping their hemoglobin fast, I know they are heading to grade three, four anemia. I don't actually let most of my patients develop severe anemia. I actually reduce the dose of talazoparib by the time they are getting to hemoglobin of nine, for example. Mm. And I preempt. So I think this side effect monitoring early on is quite important. A timely dose reduction allows vast majority of patients to allow, to to get thalazoparib or in that case, in that from that perspective, PARP inhibitors for really long periods of time. No, that's great to know. Um, I guess you know one last question here is you kind of hinted at this. Do all patients get equal benefits, or are are there subsets of patients that really this is 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 a home run, and other subsets where it's maybe a little bit harder of a you know decision? Great question. Everybody does not get similar magnitude of benefit, but so is the case with every single approved drug we have in the clinic, whether it is uh, chemotherapy with docetaxel, whether it is lutetium one seven seven, or so on. So key is to identify who is going to benefit the most. We know patients with HRA mutations, they benefit more than patients who do not have HRA mutations. Within HRA mutation category, patients with BRCA2, BRCA1 mutations seem to derive more benefit, a higher magnitude of benefit than patients who have CDK12, PALB2, RAD51, and many other mutations. So the bottom line is, when we start patients on PARP inhibitor combination therapies, I follow them. And as long as they respond, I treat them. But I don't rule out anyone for being treated with the combination just because of my own preconception or biases. I want everyone to have the opportunity to be of to have this combination available. And then I follow them and they I treat them for as long as they respond. No, it makes sense. You you want to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're gonna be the responder. So um, any final thoughts? Comprehensive genomic profiling is a must for all prostate cancer patients. Unfortunately, still a small number of patients are undergoing comprehensive genomic profiling. And we all know from our experience when we were doing this profound trial, which led to approval of OLAP, but it was a first targeted therapy for prostate cancer, 30% patients did not have adequate quality or quantity of tissue in the MCRPC setting to allow them for testing, to allow them to undergo testing. So my request to you, my, I urge each of my colleagues out there to send out the tumor tissue for comprehensive genomic profiling for every single patient when we see them for the first time with advanced prostate cancer, which include metastatic prostate cancer or locally advanced prostate cancer, and based on emerging therapies, even high-risk localized prostate cancer, if they're if their insurance allows, if they are financially, there is no uh, constraint out there. No, it's a great message. We're, we're definitely not testing enough, and it creates challenges when they get to late stage as to what to do. So, um, I know you're still following the, the patients for overall survival. So we're, we're we got our fingers crossed that it's going to show benefits for the patients, and we will certainly have you back when when we have those data and talk about the, the next round of things. But it's been so great, Niraj, to have you on the call. Um, really appreciate your time today. Great work, practice changing, really important stuff. So congratulations. Thank you very much. And congratulations to you, Steve, again, for publishing the profound uh, MBOC trial results in New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, we marched together. So thank you for the opportunity here. Yeah, it was great to have you.